Okay, hi guys. So I thought I'd talk through my solution for number four on problem set 38. Um, but before I get to four, I thought the result from number three would be really useful to show. Um, so three is a, a sort of simpler problem than four, where there's a charge big Q sitting somewhere, and you bring another charge big Q towards it from infinity. And the question first is how much work is done in that process? So what I did here was um, I used our definition of work, which is just an integral of force along some path, and then said, I'm starting at infinity here, integrating to some position R, and I'm integrating the force that the second charge experiences, which is Coulomb's law, KQ squared over R squared, um, DR along that path. And if you do that, you get this expression evaluated at the bounds. The lower bound with infinity goes to zero. So the work is just negative kq squared over r. So that expression right there, that's the work done. So the, the interpretation of this is that um, the negative work is the work done by the, the, the electric force as you bring the charge in. So that it's negative work because the field is pushing against the motion here. Um, another way you can think about this, if that's sort of intuitively uh, difficult to think about, is by definition, um, work is negative change in potential energy. So um, because of that, the potential energy is, the change of potential energy is positive. So you can think of that as like, if there's a change in potential energy that's positive, that means that you're sort of pushing something up a hill. So it's hard to do that. You're pushing against the, the, the way that this thing would naturally wanna go. So you're pushing the second charge in against the electric force that it feels. And that's the meaning of work being less than zero here. Um, in part B, In part B, it asks for the potential difference um, near that first charge Q, um, which is a, is a very similar operation, but a slightly different um, thing interpretively, because in part B, this implies that there's really only one charge, and we're not working with that second charge yet. So all of the mechanics kind of look the same, um, except there's an additional minus, minus sign here because of the definition of the change in potential. And the expression looks the same as it did in part A, except for there's no Q squared. It's just one factor of Q because the field only has one factor of Q in it when we integrate it. And also there is a positive sign instead of a minus sign because the way to think about the change in potential is very similar to the change in potential energy. So the sign is flipped there too. So it would be like pushing a positive charge up a, up a hill you're increasing potential, you'd be increasing the potential energy for a positive charge, which is what we argued in part A anyway. Okay, so those results will be useful for part four, because in part, or in question four, excuse me, because really what we're doing in question four is we're just pushing um, more charges together. Um, so part A asks, what's the potential at some point in space right here if you already have two charges sitting there. So kind of like the beginning of this problem is sort of where we ended in 3A. I've got two charges here sitting a distance R apart from each other. There's another point P in space that's a different uh, distance R um, from both of the charges Q. So it makes a, kind of, it makes a little uh, equilateral triangle. And it asks, what's the potential at point P? So the potential point P will be I calculated the exact same as I would calculate the potential of any other point. Um, integrating from infinity to that point, um, integrating the field along whatever path I take. Um, but well, this seems kind of complicated because the field is gonna be complicated because um, the field will be the addition of the field from the left charge plus the field from the right charge. But um, it, I can split it into two parts. So if I think about the field as the sum of sort of the left Q field plus the right Q field, then I can write 
this integral expression in two parts. So E from the left charge, I'll call that E sub L here, dot DL one um, minus integral E from the right charge dot DL two. And the, so the subscript one and two there means that the path could be different um, in the coordinate system that makes the most sense for each charge. But that's, these are sort of arbitrary di differences. If I imagine integrating both of these expressions, this one and this one, if I integrate them individually, I get the exact same thing I did in 3B. So each of those problems individually looks exactly like this. Um, I can just treat each of them as if they were their own point charge and then add the result together. And the result for each of them will be the same because the end result is the same. I went from infinity to some point a distance r from each charge. So I should get a potential difference from infinity of this for each charge. And if I take infinity to be my zero for potential, then I can just say that the potential at the point P is equal to the sum of the potential I would get for each individual charge. So I get twice that value. Um, it's sort of a, it's just a, it's more or less a qualitative argument. I didn't really do any additional math here. I'm just arguing that I can add the contributions of the potential linearly um, in the same way that I could add the contributions for the electric field linearly. Um, so, okay, that's cool. So in part B, if it asks um, how much work is done when I bring a third charge big Q into point P, um, then if I know the potential at point P, the potential at point P means the potential difference between infinity and that point. So if I'm asking how much work was done bringing in a charge Q from infinity, um, then really what I'm doing, all I'm doing is using the definitions for work, potential, and potential energy. So just to, to write those down, let me write them. So we, we have this definition for work as negative the change in potential energy, which is what I wrote down before. But we also know that the potential and the change in potential energy is just whatever charge is moving times the change in potential. That's how we defined potential in terms of potential energy. If you think back to the integral, um, the integral expressions that we use to define potential, that's true. So here, if I wanted the work and I know the potential difference, all I'm doing is taking negative of whatever charge is moving times the change in potential. And so that's what I have done here in part B to get the work. I took the potential difference, which is VP. So I take the potential difference here and I multiply it by the charge that's moving through that potential difference here in a minus sign. Um, and that's the work. So the work is just minus 2KQ squared over R. Um, and here the interpretation of the negative work is the same as the interpretation of the negative work in number 3a where the negative we get the negative sign because we're pushing this third charge against the electric field that exists because it's there's a big repulsive force between all of these charges um, if they're all positive charges um, so that if we wanted to do this we would have to do positive work we would have to be pushing in the direction of motion um, because the electric field is doing negative work um, so we'd have to do a minimum of at least this much work positively to get it to point P with no kinetic energy left over. Um, so for part C, uh, part C is a great question. I think it's really tricky. Um, and it, it, it's a question about how much total work was done really in creating this configuration of three charges that all sit together in an equilateral triangle. And the way to think about it is to think about this sequentially. Like, how would you create this configuration from scratch? And the way that you create this configuration from scratch is by taking, you start with one charge. I guess I'll draw a little picture here. So you start with one charge in space here. 
This is church Q. Nothing around it. There's two other charges. Wait, hold on. It seems like my iPad wasn't syncing. Give me one second. Okay, there we go. So imagine, so here I've got a charge Q in space sitting by itself. This is a tiny little diagram that I'm going to use as an aid while I'm talking. And there's no other charges around it. Um, if I wanted to create that equilateral triangle, so ultimately I'm going to put a charge, so distance R, I'm going to put a charge here, and then I'm going to put another charge right here, right? But first I don't have any other charges except the first one. And then I bring in another charge. So here's another charge Q. And if it starts infinitely far away, then I bring it in to this point. So how much work does it take to do that? It takes uh, KQ squared over R. Um, or minus kq squared over r, if we're talking about the work done by the electric force. That's just the result from problem three. Um, so to create this, the total change in potential energy here in that first step, for the first step, is kq squared over r. Um, that's how much potential energy was added when I moved in that second charge from infinity to be near to the first charge. But then there's a second step here, which is, let me take, I've got another charge out here at infinity, way over here. And then I bring that in now. So this third charge is now coming in against the two charges that already exist. So I bring that in from infinity and I put it right there. And it took some work to do that. So this is a second step to create this um, triangle of charge. So how much work was done in that second step? Well, it's exactly what we, what we had in part B right here. This is the work done in the second step. So the change in potential energy is opposite that. So the amount of potential energy uh, change in the second step is 2kq squared over r. So there's two steps. Each of them implies a change in potential energy for the system. Um, if we started you know, at the beginning with all the charges infinitely apart from each other and there's no potential energy there at all, right? these two steps increase the potential energy by the sum of the two steps. So the first step I get kq squared over r, the second step I get 2kq squared over r. So in total, if I wanted the total change in potential energy, I would just add both of those um, because I keep the potential energy of the first step when I do the second step. I'm just adding more potential energy in that second step. So in total, I'm really just adding those steps together to get a total change in potential energy equal to that. So 3kq squared over r is the addition of the potential energy change in both steps. Um, it's kind of an interesting argument. Um, and we'll use this argument later when we start calculating how much energy is stored in um, continuous charge distributions, which is something that we can do. And you can see how this argument might lead in that direction um, because every time you add a little bit more charge to every charge distribution, you have to think about how much potential energy is added due to the existence of all the other charges in that charge distribution that were um, present before you did that last step. Um, so I hope that kind of makes sense. It's an interesting and kind of tricky conceptual problem, um, and I'm happy to talk about it more in class. Um, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.